So, just a short introduction about me because some, I guess I know most of you already, but there is some confusion with regards to KDAB, KDE and stuff. And just want to make sure that you know that KDAB or KDAB is a company and KDE, which uh, this shirt is hailing from, is the largest C++ open source project in the world. Uh, so, a lot of people came to me and said thank you for working on KDE, which is awesome to hear. Unfortunately, it's a little bit depressing bit because I kind of feel like an imposter because I'm, I'm not as active anymore inside of KDE, so it's kind of like living on the old fame that some, uh, existed at some point. And I don't want to take... Uh, the kudos from the people who deserve it today. So I would say, uh, if you want to thank anybody about KD, just contact the whole KD community and say thank you. So apart from that, I guess you know that I wrote a random book that nobody read. Uh, I'm also a trained, although it, it, it has been translated into a lot of languages, so I have a huge, huge potential audience. Uh, potential. <laughs> uh, apart from that, obviously, as almost everybody here, I'm also a trainer, consultant. I am kind of inactive in the working group 21, etc., etc. So, this is my tenth year speaking at meeting C++, and I feel old. I feel really old and worse for tear. So, I found one of my favorite albums and I wanted to show it on the screen. So, too old to rock and roll, too young to die. So, this is kind of how I feel uh, at the moment. My first talk in MTC++ was called Monads in Chains. And to be honest, I never expected it to be accepted at a conference. Uh, and it was the most involved one, so the most difficult to follow and kind of it went downhill from there. Um, every talk was, I heard that they are not bad talks, but they were simpler and simpler. And today's talk will be the simplest of all, for two reasons. First, everybody is tired, including me. I'm kind of in a jet lag mode. Uh, and this, as a keynote, needs to be, let's say, for a wider set, uh, set of people than what I usually am for. I usually aim for, for people who have been in C++ for a lot of time and they might have their own opinions on stuff and they want to learn just a specific topic. Today we are going to be a little bit more broad and a little bit more shallow, but I still hope uh, it will be useful. Now, apart from uh, this fitting my, my mental state, uh, it's also a band that belongs to uh, an, uh, let's say, a uh, type of rock called prog rock or progressive rock. So, what is a prog rock? Prog rock is a broad uh, genre of rock music. The style was an emergence of psychedelic bands who abandoned standard pop traditions in favor of instrumentation and compositional techniques more frequently associated with jazz, folk, or classical music. And if you remember the name of the talk, the talk is called Prog C++. So what is Prog C++? Prog C++ is a broad genre of C++ code. The style was an emergence of psychedelic developers who abandoned standard C with classes for something really strange like generic functional or value-based object-oriented coding practices. Now, I've specifically written value-based object-oriented coding practices because we are not Java. Okay. And as usual, uh, I don't want to break traditions in my 10th uh, year. So I always start all the presentations with uh, one of my favorite quotes by, not really by Phil Varla. Uh, Make your code readable, pretend the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath and they know where you live. Now, for a full disclaimer, I did hear Phil Wadler say this sentence. 
but I'm 100% sure that he's not the author of it. He just repeated it. So I'm not lying by saying this is Phil Wadler's, but originally, who knows who, who wrote it, maybe a random person from the internet. And the second part of the disclaimer, obviously, if you notice some errors in the code and the slides, it's to be expected, this is slideware, this is not meant to be a production code. I'm going to use underscore t suffixes for, let's say, user types. And I'm going to assume that using std string literals is all omnipresent because it's nice to write strings with quote, quote, s. So let's start with the first small topic. Um, if you are following uh, the standardization uh, committee, you have seen that there was a meeting in Varna, which I guess many people, including myself, ignored because who can reach Varna from a normal part of the world? Uh, but they missed a huge opportunity. The opportunity was to organize the meeting in something that's called a constant. Obviously, I'm mispronouncing the name of the, of the city a little bit north from Varna, but I'm doing so intentionally. Constant is one of the most important things in C++. So I'm proposing whoever organizes those things for the next meetup to be in the constant in Romania. So let's start with constants. This is something that we often write if, because we have been thought that const by default is a good thing, so let's create a person that is going to be an immutable person called Martha Jones. Uh, who knows where the name Martha Jones is from? Doctor Who, uh, one of the better periods of Doctor Who. So if you see her name, uh, just think of Doctor Who. Now, usually, this is fine unless we need to make some customization to the object. And let's say we are trying to assign a new value to some member variable inside of uh, the person. And we just say bad hash equals something. Now, we've lost the most important thing that we had in the previous slide, and that's the const keyword. So we kind of destroyed the idea, OK, we need to be const by default just because we need to tinker a single thing. And in the whole function afterwards, people can just mutate Martha as much as they want, and people are not mutable. So one of the common idioms in a lot of languages, so not only C++, is to create, to use a lambda that is evaluated immediately. And you just create a lambda, you call it, and from the lambda you return an object. Inside of the lambda you can manipulate, mutate the object as much as you want, but once you return from the lambda, it's assigned to a const variable and you cannot mutate the object anymore. Is this fine? Should be? Okay. Now, just imagine that you don't really need Martha for every single Doctor Who episode. You just want to have Martha when you actually need her. You don't want to pull her out of her, I don't know, what, what the actors call that little house where they prepare. So you can just replace the auto with the super new keyword in C++ called lazy. And when you replace it with lazy, the rest of the code doesn't need to change. In essence, as soon as Martha is actually needed, then this lambda will be called and uh, you'll get Martha. Obviously, there are a lot of confused faces. Uh, this is a huge lie. We don't have a lazy keyword inside of C++. But fortunately enough, new, newer versions of C++ allow us to define things that will end up in code like this looking like they were just normal keywords. Lazy is nothing more than a normal class template, which accepts a function as its template parameter. So the fact that we don't need to write lazy of something, that's the class template uh, class 
CTED, uh, <laughs> look up the, what, what is abbreviation for, CTS, class template argument deduction, okay. Uh, and so if we pass it a lambda, it will automatically be used, the type of the lambda to deduce the type name of Fn. Now inside of, the, uh, of this object called lazy, in order to be, let's say, good citizens, like all things in the standard library, we should define what the value inside of this lazy thing is going to be. So we are defining a nested type called value type, just like std vector, just like std optional, and all those are the nice uh, classes or class templates. And we just we need to implement a way so that the first time we need Martha, we initialize her and every other time we just reference the old one. So kind of like singleton, but we can have multiple of these lazy values for the same internal type. So we need to obviously to store the function itself, and in order to be, let's say, thread safe, if you need that for implementation of lazy, we can just use the once flag and if we didn't initialize anything yet, we'll have an empty optional, otherwise we'll have Martha inside of the optional. Now, when we try to convert the lazy value into proper value, for example, through the cast operator or conversion operator, we can just say call once, and this will be thread safe way that guarantees that Martha will be instantiated only once, however many threads are accessing the, the same object. And after we manage to do that, we just return the reference to Martha. So whenever we talk about const objects, they have two phases, regardless of the way that we use to construct them. So the first phase is we are building the value. During the buildup, the object doesn't need to be const. The first, let's say, rationale why we are allowed to change that object, while we are building the object, nobody else sees it. It's just our object. When we finish building the object, then we can give it out to the world, and we are giving the object to the world as a const one. Okay? And then, obviously, uh, since nobody saw it before, as far as the world con is concerned, the world just sees the final product and the final const object. And then, obviously, using the value is the, using the const, const object. So just like we have almost always auto, we also have almost always const. You should define things by default as const unless there are some issues. So the first thing that you don't want to define as const are member variables. The reason for that is that you're going to disable move semantics, so move operations like assignment and the move construction. Then you don't want to make local variables that you're going to return from the function as const because um, if the return value optimization doesn't happen, then it cannot be moved from your function into the caller. And the last one, if you have a variable that you want to pass in to something else, so for example, you have an object, you no longer, you don't want to use it afterwards, you just want it to move to somebody else, you cannot make it const as well. And I don't really like having rules that say, but. I want to have rules that say, always do this. So can we make, something that will behave like a const, but still be move-enabled without changing the compiler and changing the standard. Just like we did a lazy object, we can create a new wrapper. And obviously we cannot use the keyword const, but we can invent our own called immutable. Inside of immutable, we're going to have a member variable. And as we said, we don't make member variables const. So we are following the rules that we've seen before. Then we create copy operations, we create move operations, equals default, equals default, equals default. We don't need to do anything special here. The only thing that needs to be special, we can define the accessors. 
and all the accessors need to return const objects. So const references or const pointers. OK? So even if the internal variable is not const, you can use it only as a const from the outside world. Fair enough? Now, the only situation where I would say it would be perfectly fine if you removed the const is if this immutable object was a temporary. So R value reference and not an L value reference. So, which means that make everything const except variables that you want <clears throat> to give away. So if you have a temporary object, we are never going to look at it inside of it ever again. Whoever uses that object can just pull out the value. That object will never be looked at again, so as far as the world is concerned, it, it hasn't changed. And you pulled out a value that afterwards you can convert to const. So we, can, we have created a nice wrapper that we can now, by default, use everywhere that we want. So the almost always const can just be switched to always immutable. So for member variables, declare immutable of std string instead of const string. It will have the same semantics without having the move operations disabled. For local variables that you want to return, again, by default, return value optimization will happen. If it doesn't happen because of some conversion, some complicated code inside of the function, then the result will be moved into the caller, which again doesn't work for const, but it will work for immutable. And the same thing if we have a local variable that we want to move to somebody else. Again, we wouldn't be able to create it const, but we can create it to be immutable. And the cool thing is that, well, we cannot write const person something. We need to write const auto person something. For immutable, C++ is even nicer, and we can just say immutable person instead of auto immutable person or something like that. So in some situations, we even get a little bit of a better syntax. Questions so far? If not, we can move on. So we have extended the language to have two new keywords. One keyword is lazy, and the other keyword is immutable. And they're kind of used in a similar way. Immutable needs just added parentheses to call a lambda, because it accepts a value and not a function, and lazy just accepts the function. Now, obviously, if you don't care about immutable functions, you could say if const expr, if it's a function, then call it. If it's not a function but a value, then create immutable of that value so that you could also remove the parentheses at the end. So one of the things that I would like you to remember from this talk is that it's fine to implement things that go against the language when the language is insufficient or wrong for your use case or domain. If you remember the keynote from the last year, uh, Nico had huge uh, problems because views from the ranges library are shallow const. And a lot of people from the standards committee think it's fine because it's the way that references kind of behave in C++. They're not deep const, they're shallow const. So it's a let's say, a valid excuse for the, range, for the views to be const views, but still allow you to change the objects that are below. Now, if we followed that the C++ behaves like this, so in the standard library we don't want to do anything against that, we wouldn't have std invoke, which says, okay, language doesn't allow us to call member functions with the parentheses, so we are going to add something in the standard that circumvents that. We wouldn't have unique pointers, because somebody could say that new and delete exist in the language, and unique pointer doesn't behave like new and delete. But that's not the point. The point of the library is to create something that is safer, especially if you see that the language is lacking in, in a specific place. So immutable fixes one issue of const, so it's perfectly fine to create something like that. Now, the next section is something that 
as I said, I'm growing old, and people, when they grow old, they kind of get uh, annoyed by everything. So I guess half of the audience understands what I'm talking about, right? So when you're young, you're energetic, you get a code review, and you're like, happy, okay, this can be better, this can be better. And when you get old, it's just get off my lawn, right? So if somebody makes a mistake that you hate seeing after 10 years of meeting C++, for example, you will get annoyed. And this is one of the idioms that everybody knows about, that is documented in lots and lots of books and wiki pages and whatnot. And everybody does a custom thing that is unrelated to what I'm going to talk about. And I really, really hate when I see a custom implementation of the following thing. So we've had the assignment operator in, in a few slides before, but, and it was completely fine to say equals default because we just had a single variable inside of that type. Now for persons, they usually have mem more than one mem member variable, so for example, a name and a surname. And if we want to update the name and the surname of a specific person, and an exception happens in the, let's say, in between the assigning the name and the surname, we'll get half of an update, which is not a good thing. And I, I assume that everybody agrees. So if we get an exception between two member variables being updated, we'll get an object that is half updated and half not. If you want to be on the safe side, you should either have a fully updated object and no exception, or the old version of the object and the exception. And the idiom here that, again, many people ignore is, will be called copy and swap, but this is still not it. You create a new person, you initialize the values that you want inside, and you just swap it with the current person. Quite a trivial idea, and again, most of the people don't want to use it for some reason. Now, in the, we obviously need swaps for all of our objects if we want to use swaps. So there are several different ways to define swaps, but let's go for the old school one uh, as a friend function. So friend void swap left and right. How can we swap two, two things? We can just say std tie to put all the member variables inside of a tuple of references for the one object and for the other and call std swap because obviously tuples support swapping. And this is not obvious. Uh, this is just from recent C++ standards. This wouldn't work in C++ 11 if I remember correctly. But since we are in the future, then this is perfectly fine code. Now, you've probably seen std tie used for operator less than and similar ones. It's quite useful for swaps as well. So in order to create the full idiom called copy and swap, this is something that always should happen inside of the assignment operator. And this is the only valid way to implement the assignment operator. What we are doing here is we are creating a temporary copy of the original object that we want to assign to, the, to this. If an exception occurs, it will occur at that stage. If the exception occurred, we are just going to exit from this operator, the memory will be freed, and the object will be unchanged. If this thing succeeded, so no exception was thrown, then we call swap. Swap is always no except if you implement it correctly. So, it will just flip the temporary object and us, and we will become what the temporary object was. When we exit the function, the old values from us will be destroyed, and we will have the new values inside. And this is perfectly exception-safe code. So proper safety, either I have updated fully, so a transaction, or I haven't updated at all. The move version, similar as the previous one, just with one std move added. So, uh, in just in the case if my moving on the stage didn't communicate what happens uh, clearly enough, if we want to assign this circle to the object with a square, we are creating a copy of the circle, we are swapping, 
and in the end we have just uh, remained in in our cells we have the new value so the circle now there is one little detail what is the prerequisite of the copy and swap to work you cannot have references as member variables this is one of the most annoying things that I've seen in past few years is that even if people know about copy and swap and start implementing things with copy and swap because it's safe, but they kind of want to optimize a few parts and create references directly to some data that will be used often. What will happen if in the copy and swap idiom if you create a reference like this? First, creating a copy will mean we are creating a temporary object that references something from the original one. Okay. The next step is a swap. Now, swap on references doesn't swap the pointers. It swaps the values. So even if you have created a copy, you're referencing the original object, you're not changing the pointers inside, you're going to change your reference, the value that your reference points to, with the value that this reference points to. So you kind of end up with essentially a double swap for, for, for a few things. But usually you end up with undefined behavior. So member variables should never be references. It's better to create them to be even raw pointers than to create references. If you really like references, then you can use std reference wrapper. So member variables, if you want to be good people who create values, uh, you should always have values to be member variables inside of your types. Then your type will be somewhat of a value type. So, Additional thing that I think that copy and swap is use for, useful for is that the idea behind it is not only tied to the assignment operators. Swapping is everywhere in our industry. So if you work with graphics, the first thing that you're going to learn is about double buffering. What is double buffering? I'm showing you something, then I'm drawing, 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 drawing. You don't see what I'm drawing. And then when I'm finished, when I have the finished object, I just swap these two. Okay? A similar thing, if you have one thread that collects some data, collects some data, at some point it wants to pass the data on, and it's not a contiguous uh, process, so it's not this thread is producing and this one is consuming, but it should happen from time to time that all the collected data should just be transferred somewhere else. Then swaps are, again, uh, a little bit of your friend. So one of the examples where, obviously, we as C++ developers don't care about garbage collection, but a situation where this is quite, quite often used is the mark and sweep algorithm for garbage collection. So what does mark and sweep do? It goes through, from the root object, through all the objects that can be visited. Sets a flag, this is live, this is live, this is live. And then at the end, it goes through all the objects that were ever allocated and collect those that should be deleted. Okay? So, the first step is mark. And after that, we just go through all the objects. If the object is marked, then just reset the flag. If the object is not marked, then it's, it's garbage, so it should be deleted. But deletion is often expensive. And you don't want to, for the mark and sweep to work, you kind of need to stop the world in order to process everything, and then when the garbage collection finishes, you continue the world. You don't want to do deletions during your main application, so the, the main event loop you're going to slow down the application. So often, instead of calling delete, you just want to schedule it for later, or to schedule it for, to be executed on a separate thread. So instead of having delete, we can just say garbage push back for this object. Then, when this finishes, we can continue the normal execution of the program. 
The program can execute without any issues, even if we haven't deleted all the garbage yet. Now, the thing that we can do is, again, just swap, create an empty garbage collection, swap these two. Now, we are going to have an empty garbage collection, and we have given the full garbage can to somebody else, and we can just continue working. And the only thing that needs to be synchronized in this case for a multi-threaded garbage collection is the swap. So the idea of a swap, even if we don't often use it in our code, it's a really, really powerful thing. Just imagine you're a magician and you do some trickery. And we are all obviously magicians in, uh, when we write, write code. So remember, swap, if you like STD Rotate because of Sean Parent, then you should like swap because of somebody else. Uh, OK. So the next one, really important thing states. We had this quote already. So at my first uh, meeting C++, uh, Scott Myers showed one of my favorite landmarks of Berlin, which I'm not going to mention today because it's not that popular anymore. Uh, and this meeting C++, Kevlin showed one of my favorite, squo favorite quotes from John Carmack. So a large fraction of flaws in software development are due to programmers not fully understanding the possible states their code may execute in. Now we are all learned to fear the undefined behavior in the compiler. When we do something, oh, it's undefined behavior, the compiler can do whatever it wants. But it's the same for our programs. If our program can get into an invalid state, which is a state that you haven't accounted for in advance, your program is in undefined behavior. Your program can be abused to do many, many evil things. So just like undefined behavior inside of the compiler is an issue, illegal state is the undefined behavior of your software. So if you manage to push your software into an invalid state, you should watch for Patricia, uh, Patricia's talks on uh, security vulnerabilities that just needed a little nudge for your program to have, let's say, one variable wrong. So how we, do, we deal with states in C++, we create classes, we create a lot of things inside, and as Miller said, when you create a class or a structure, it's kind of a nice bag to put things in. And as a new developer comes in, they will put even more things in. And you just get a huge, huge chunk of state with some variables tightly bound, some completely independent, etc. And after a while, because we are all serious developers, we are defensive developers, we are going to add us asserts inside of our functions. So if you're implementing a web browser, and we are implementing a web page, and we have a function called render, obviously we are going to assert that DOM, the document object model thingy, is not an alt pointer. Fair enough. It's good to put asserts everywhere or throw exceptions. Now, when we've rendered the page, we want to execute the JavaScript, so execute event loop. Every uh, li UI library has an event loop, so JavaScript as well. Inside of that, we also want to assert that DOM is not an alt pointer. And in order to execute JavaScript, I guess a web page should be fully loaded, so we are going to assert also that we are not currently in the loading phase. Then we are going, obviously, we need to load the page. So if you want to load a page, the document object model needs to be null because we shouldn't have loaded anything before. We shouldn't be in the loading process at the moment, and we should not have already established a connection to, to the web page that you want to load. So we have created several member functions for our type. And then we said, OK, this member function doesn't work in these cases. This member function doesn't work in these cases, etc. Is that a single type then? 
if you disabled half of the functions in some of the states, should, it, should that be in the same type? Obviously not. If you have a cat, you're not going to say, okay, this cat can jump if it's orange. It can drink milk if it's orange. If it's blue, it can, I don't know, walk or lie on its back. And if it, if it has wings, it can fly. If it has wings, it's obviously a bird. So it's not the same type as a cat. And the same thing goes for all of these things. And this is something that we commonly write, myself included. A lot of projects will end up with huge objects that you just disable some functions in some situations. Apart from that, obviously, you can easily get into invalid states. If you have that many asserts in your code, it means that your type, the type that you design, allows you to be in completely invalid states. So instead, obviously, we should use something like, we should create different types. So we need initial type, initial, let's say, object, which will just contain the URL. We should have the loading one, which will just contain connection and the document object model. And once we've loaded, we just need to have DOM. All the member functions that we've created so far will just end up being member functions of these three objects. And this is no longer something that is runtime checked. This is now compile time checked. If I have loaded, then I can execute JavaScript. And obviously, we just need to put everything inside of a variant for this to work. I guess you have seen how to visit variants quite a few times during your lifetime, so I'm going to skip this one and skip this one, unless somebody sees a potential issue in the code. Maybe not really this code, but the code that can uh, become after this one evolves a little bit. What are we doing here? So if we are in the loading state, we are switching the state to loaded or whatever. Does anybody see something that could lead to undefined behavior? Compiler undefined behavior. Yeah, does. Sorry? Uh, Okay, <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> yeah, get if is going to. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so syntactically wrong, but uh, let's. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> yeah, slide where. Uh, this is an arrow, but it's uh, it's a small font, so you didn't see it. Okay, that's a good comment. So, in the previous one, we have a dangling reference. In this one, we have a dangling pointer. What's the reason? We have the current, let's say, a square inside of our variant. We are creating a reference or a pointer to that square, and we are changing what is, what is inside. So, we have a reference to the old object, or a point to the old object. Obviously, th this code that was in the slides, apart from the syn syntactical problem problems with rendering, uh, <laughs> is perfectly fine, because we are not using those references, we are not using those pointers, so we are not going to reach undefined behavior. But in the future, somebody could just ex extend this handler and add something that is going to use the reference or a pointer. So instead, we need to fix the issue. If we want to be future-proof completely, then we're gonna get, get, again, swap. So we have the old state somewhere. Then we create a page T, which is a new page. It can be copied, it can be just an empty object. And then we generate a new state. When this new state is generated, we still haven't removed the old object from the current state. 
So all the references, all the pointers are still valid. And once we get out of the overloaded STD visit or the if, uh, get if, after that we just call swap. And only at that point we are going to get the switch once all the pointers and references uh, are out of the scope. So for example, with the get if, we would just say new page equals loaded T. And after we exit, after all the references and pointers are out of the scope, then we do the swap and we are fine. So again, swap is a really cool and simple algorithm. Now, sometimes you don't want to update the state. So maybe this is not generic enough. If we don't want to update the state, then we don't want the new page to actually contain anything. So we want the new page to be empty. How can we create a new page that is empty and we can check whether it's empty or not? Optional. optional. So if you want to have this optionalness of updating the state, you just create optional new page and if you actually put something inside, then do the swap, otherwise just ignore. And this idiom is now perfectly safe, you cannot reach any undefined behavior inside. Now, if we talked about variance, obviously we need to talk about expected, but I'm not going to repeat the talk from the previous year. I'm just going to remind you what expected is. So again, Kevin mentioned NANs, minus ones for special values, etc. In order to communicate an error, we can obviously use whatever we want in C++. The new and the cool thing is the expected. So the expected is a class that can, can contain a value or it can contain an information about the error that happened and the reason why the value is not present. And it has some really, really cool and useful member functions for which if you want to, uh, to look at them, I don't usually reference myself, but the, my talk from the previous year was amazing. Uh, <laughs> so you should probably go check out that one instead of anybody else's talks. And yeah, people did talk about expected, but not as good as I did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the thing that I mentioned back then is that if you like the semantics of exceptions, but you like expected because you're not allowed to use exceptions inside of embedded environments, obviously you can abuse coroutines to, uh, to kind of simulate the same thing. So if anything that you co on returns an error, you just drop out of the current function and return that error. Otherwise, you're free to use that value. So in the first line, we say as it is string input is coavate of get input. If get input returned an error, the whole function exits, just like with exceptions. And if the input was properly generated, then this as it is string input will have a proper value and we just move on to the second line. Now, again, this is again cool and nice and everything else. And some people even proposed something similar but a little bit more powerful, well, some people, Herb Sutter, uh, for inclusion to the standard called, uh, commonly referred to as Herb, Herbceptions or something like that. But all of these things share, as far as I'm concerned, one flaw, even this one. Uh, if you want an implementation for Coavate on something like expected, you can check uh, Antoine's uh, really nice blog post. Uh, you have a QR code for, for the direct link for, to that one. So, again, to abuse Kevin's analogy from a few days ago, while we are making lunch, we make mess. This mess is not a problem as far as C++ is concerned, we have destructors. So all the mess that we create while making lunch will automatically dis uh, disappear because of the constructor. The issue that C++ has uh, is with when you get a lunch burnt. So you're making rice and it gets a little bit sticky on the bottom and a little bit darker than the rice usually should be. What does the C++ do? 
Okay, throw an exception, and which means essentially forget about making the lunch, destroy the kitchen, and move on. <laughs> and this is not the way to handle errors. Just imagine if anything that you tried in your life and you failed on the first time. Okay, I, I, I'm off. That's not something that we should, well, we, we do often, but it's not healthy. So, usually we try to find a fix. In the situation with the rice, obviously take a clean pot, pour all the rice that is not burned into the clean pot and continue making lunch. No need to destroy the apartment. And obviously, after we found a fix, then just continue the process. So, the choosing of the fix is not on the algorithm that is being called. The algorithm can offer you approaches. Do you want to stop making lunch? Do you want to use a clean pot? Do you want to use the burnt rice for tea? Again, my cha. Or, or you want to do something else with the burnt rice? And then, when you decide, you tell the algorithm, okay, continue with this choice applied. This is not something that is possible with exceptions, nor with Coavate, nor with any of, of the previous ones. But again, this is completely normal interaction between humans. And this is my uh, gorgeous attempt at drawing humans. Obviously, I didn't go to, an art, to art school. Uh, but, let's say, this kind of looks close enough. So, if you know the, the song from the Sword in the Stone, again, uh, who knows the song and the cartoon? Or who knows the cartoon? Yeah, only old people. Uh, <laughs> so, for the young ones, please Google this. Uh, it's one of the nicer Disney songs from, from the old era. So, it's to and fro, stop and go, that's what makes the world go round. And uh, if I remember correctly, the authors of the song are Weizmann Brothers. And just like Kevlin says that Shakespeare created memory management and so on, Weizmann Brothers created coroutines. So we have two coroutines, we go to and fro, and each of the coroutines just stops and goes, stops and goes, and that's what makes your program go round. So, when we want to communicate between those, those two people, we would just create either random classes or, again, variants of different messages that can be communicated to and fro. So, for example, if you're parsing, so no longer cooking rice, we can have a number parsing error, we can invalid type error on one hand side, and for the fix, you can have use zero instead of whatever you parsed or skip the current line. Just for an example, usually you will have a little bit more elaborate things with variants of different types. So, this picture that we've had, just forget the sticky figures and think of functions. These functions would be called coroutines, and you have seen this picture just with functions a dozen times on previous conferences that talked about coroutines. So, a communication between two entities. So, if you want to say what a message is, we would say a message is either a, an error message, so the one direction, or a fixed message which goes in the, in the other direction. Now, we can create, we can say a result of our coroutine is going to be either the result, so the value, we have parsed, some, parsed something successful, successfully, or it can be a message containing an error. So we can just say, okay, result T is going to be expected of result and message T pointer. We'll see why it's a pointer a little bit afterwards. And then we can just create our parser function not as something that returns expected, but it returns generator of these expecteds. What does this mean? This means that the same function can return us an error multiple times, just like a normal person, and whenever you hear a new error that occurred, you can say, okay, try this, new error, okay, try this, new error, try this. If all of those fixes succeeded, you're going to end up with a result. 
If you find an error that is not reco uh, recoverable, then you can just say, okay, by this time I really give up, I cannot parse this file. Okay? So, we are going to create a message which will be essentially a communication channel between the coroutine and the caller. And any time that we find an error, we're just going to co-yield an unexpected value and uh, with an error inside. Obviously, I intentionally implemented everything without creating custom types just by using STD generator so that you see what so that I don't hide anything as a magician does. Obviously, if you uh, were to implement something like this, I would advise you to hide all of these ugly things like STD unexpected STD address of message into a dedicated object. So don't use the generator directly, but let's say create a wrapper on top of generator which provides you with all of these. Now, in the situation on the caller side, we have co-await parse. The first time that we don't get a result, we are going to propose a new fix. The second time we don't get a result, but an error, we are going to propose a new fix, so we have a while true. And in the situation where we got a proper result and not an error, we are just going to exit out of the while loop because we have success successfully parsed the whole file. So coroutines, while we usually talk about them in the terms of asynchronous tasks and yada yada, can be quite useful even for much more uh, nuanced error handling than exceptions allow us than anything that C++ already has allowed us ever in history. Obviously I'm lying, but I'm trying to sell you something. <laughs> Any questions so far? Something online? Um, yeah, I'm looking into the online questions. So, um, regarding the usage of a cert, Coming from an embedded software background, I'm told by many experts a search should be avoided in embedded systems. A quick Google search now I see funny there is a contact, there's a contradicting suggestions. Use do not use on it depends. What are your thoughts about the certs and embedded? Um, okay, so I hate asserts as much as the next guy and use them as much as the next guy. Uh, I completely agree. And that's one of the reasons why I'll, I think that the code that we started with before the variant stuff is full of code smell. As soon as we have that many asserts, we have designed our types in a wrong way. So I would completely agree with the comment uh, that, that that person had. Okay. And I would say this is irregardless of whether it's embedded or not. Obviously for embedded, you have killed a dozen people in a, an airplane. For, for a desktop, you kind of forgot to save a file. Different, different problems, but the same cause. Anything else? Andreas? Yeah, one simple question. Uh, why are you passing a pointer instead of using the return from the co-yield? Yeah, I kind of kind of wanted to to skip that, <laughs> uh, to skip around that. So we need to have the communication mechanism, and in order not to talk about how coroutines work for I don't know tenth tenth time on all the conferences, I've used the most uh, what's the expression A rope and stick solution that I could could imagine. So. Coroutines can communicate in an official way between the caller and the callee, but if, even if we don't know a single thing about coroutines, we can simulate that by creating a variable on the stack and just passing that variable to and fro from the caller to the callee. Now, again, it's 
a little bit of a risk to pass a pointer to something on that that looks like it's on the stack, but this is in a coroutine frame which will exist as long as we are co-yielding, co-yielding, co-yielding from the result. So it's still memory safe even if it doesn't really appear to be so. Yo, one more question. Um, for the problem you mentioned for object construction, how about default initializing the member variable inline in the class and so every person object is different. Uh, not sure I get the point. Yeah, neither am I, so it's <laughs> <laughs> I would welcome uh, an email or something like that. I, I will gladly, gladly respond. Um, actually, there's another embedded question. Can we use the coroutines and expect it and embed it with, a, with an allocator inside the promise so that we don't use heap allocations? There are a lot of talks about coroutines, and that question appears every once okay. in a while. A lot of things can be achieved, can be used and embedded with a little bit of hardship. But again, that would be a little bit of a huge digression for this talk. But I would, again, send me an email, I'll gladly point you to some of the people who exactly talked about the same, the same ideas before. Sure. All right, let's carry on. Okay. Okay, so again, if you hate this syntax, just wrap it inside of a type. If you even hate the local uh, variable message, then invest several days into understanding how coroutines work. Again, from the past year, uh, there were really nice talks, two of them, I'm not going to mention Phil Nash, uh, because last year I, I mentioned the other guy and I don't know whether Phil got offended or not, so I'm going to mention him this time. So Phil also had a really great talk about coroutines in the previous meeting in C++. So check out both of those and you'll kind of get some vague idea that you don't want to deal with coroutines, but use the already implemented things like STD generator. Okay, so as far as the errors go, once we really have a value, so not an error, we can just say co-yield the final result. So the main point of this idiom would be, so it allows you to continue in the process, uh, in, in the presence of errors, but it's, you can still bail out if you reach something that you cannot handle. Now, the penultimate small section. We are going a little bit down, down the hill. The coroutine stuff is usually a little bit more, let's say, annoying. Uh, so we are going back to the simpler, simpler topics. If you didn't see regular revisited talk by Victor, Victor uh, you should, again, when it becomes available. He explains in let's say, mathematical level of details, what values are, regular is, etc. And it's well worth watching. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not going to use any mathematical definitions of values, just use, let's say, your better judgment until you watch Victor's talk. So the, f the only thing that I would like to differentiate is between values and variables. We usually say value type, we usually say value semantics. That's not, the type of a value is a thing, the value type isn't. Reference and value semantics are not an entity of values or for references, it's about assignment. So a value is something that the variable refers to. A value is number 42. A value is a name, Martha Jones. Value is not something that you can change to 43. You can change the variable to be 43 and it will point to a different value. Okay? So when people say values, when, when I at least try to say values, I'm usually referring to some const object that is somewhere in the memory. If you're allowed to change that object, it's no longer the same value. Okay? 
So if I asked you, we have a unique pointer of const something, is that a value? Let's say. So whatever that pointer contains currently will point to something that is const. So whenever you use it, you're just going to see the same value. If you have a shared pointer of const something, again, the same story goes. It's a single value. Nobody in their sane mind would probably say that unique pointer is a value type, right? It's a type that references something. But this is a really important distinction. One of the notes that I'm usually annoyed with when people talk about multithreading is that we have that notion that as soon as we are sharing something, then we need a mutex. And a good comment uh, from this talk by Shivam was that if something is constant, even if, strictly speaking, it will end up with false sharing, blah, 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 we don't have the problems of that false sharing because no synchronization will ever happen because no data can be changed. If you have immutable data, then even if it's shared, you don't need any mutex. So if we have a values and we share values between multi -thre uh, multiple threads, it's perfectly safe. If we have variables that we are sharing across multiple threads, variables that can change the value inside, that's a problem. But we are so accustomed to change all the objects that we have that it's a common thing to say as soon as you have shared resources, you need mutexes, you need synchronization. So just remember, if you have mutable shared resources, that's the only situation where you need synchronization. Um, that was a little bit of a digression. So, for values, let's say we should have these operations. Obviously, not, we don't need copying always, we don't need moving always, but if we wanted to be, uh, let's say, good people, we should allow several different variables to hold the value 42, okay? So copies should be, let's say, most, mostly provided, and obviously it always should be a valid value. If something is 42, it's a valid value. You cannot have an integer that is not an integer. If you want something that can be an integer but can be empty, then obviously it's not an integer, it's optional of int. And then in that situation, empty optional is a valid value. Okay, so let's a little bit move on. We don't consider really a unique pointer to something to be a value. And I said that any time that we want to be good people and create value types, whatever those are, we should create only member variables which are value types. And in most of our minds, this is not going to fit the bill. So instead, What's the, what are the issues with, the, with having, let's say, a pimple that's a unique pointer? The pimple, uh, how many people know about the pimple idiom? Cool. So implementing something like this allows you to have first invalid states. The pimple pointer can be a null pointer, which is not a valid state for the pimple idiom. You have shallow const, so you get, again, uh, you annoy Nikoyosotis. After that, you don't have copying because you have a unique pointer inside. And another thing, you're allowed to change what the pointer points to, which again is not the pimple idiom. Pimple should just be something that is on the heap, which is always tied to my current object. And then you end up with adding a few things. So on the construction, you're going to create an instance for this pointer to point to which means that you need to patch all the constructors in your class to, ex to initialize the mpimple. The second thing, how can we solve so the, the const propagation? Instead of allowing your, let's say, people who implement the rest of the class, instead of allowing them to access the pimple directly, 
you provide member functions that, depending on whether they are a const qualified or not, they return a const reference to the pimple or they return a mutable reference to the pimple. And now you have created something that is kind of like the STD experimental propagate const. So you kind of disallowed the default behavior C++ that const is shallow. You have implemented the proper thing. If I am const, then everything that I depend on is const. For the copy construction, <clears throat> obviously, again, make unique, you are calling the copy constructor of the page private T, which should always, for pimples, be a final class, so no inheritance, no slicing is going to happen here. And obviously, the assignment operator you are going to implement with the copy and swap operator. Now, again, a small uh, digression. I love those. Uh, if we have a shared pointer to const private t, and we want to create a copy and change the value, we have something that is called copy and write. How many people are experienced with copy and write? Not in file systems? <laughs> okay, so copy and write is an excellent idea. It works awesomely well in file systems, and it works abysmally bad in C++ and most languages. And usually, they're not really needed for us. For example, in Qt library, all the classes are, let's say, collection classes are copy and write. And then you have some strange rules saying, well, if you try to use this with a range-based for loop, it's going to be slow because it copies the call, whole collection. But I'm just reading the collection. Yeah, but I don't know that you're creating an iterator to something and you will be able to change it. The fact that you are not going to change it, nah. It's, it's not important, I'm going to copy the whole collection. But that's really not needed in C++. We have a common thing in C++, if somebody passed a, a const ref to something and we need a copy to change it, just copy it. You don't need some smart class implementation to think about when you want to, this to be copied or not, just explicitly say, okay, I want a copy, I don't want the original. So in the situation where we have the, the shared pointer to a const object, that's a perfectly fine, perfectly safe thing to have in your program. Multi-threaded, no locking, because it's a shared const resource. If you want to create something new out of it, you don't want to create a smart API that works like copy on write, you just need a, a, a single function that will take that const object, transform it into something that you need, and then return it a shared pointer to the const new object. So in a page, so again, a web page, which is internally just a const thing, you can just create transform member functional like std optional he has, like std expected he has. Internally, it's a const then you transform that internal value to create a new version of a page. And again, multi-thread safe, completely safe because we don't have any mutations that are shared across the threads. Now to get back on the pimple thing, we have created a few different things just to fix the issue of the unique pointer with pimples. Now, those issues don't exist only with pimples. Any time that you need a pointer inside of your as a member variable, and we said we want values, unique pointer is going to be bad for you. So instead, instead of every time implementing all the patches that we've had for, for the unique pointer, just create a new class template that can be called heap value or value pointer or whatever you want. And when you want to create a new instance of this object, it will behave as an object on the stack, but it will be allocated on the heap. Model some uh, smaller, let's say, syntax changes. And this should be fairly trivial to implement. So a constructor that just calls make unique, 
The only note that uh, I want to make here is that the requires clause needs to disable if you have just one argument and it's the same type as heap value, then you should disable this constructor so not to infringe on the copy operations. Accessors, the same as before. So const in the, if they're const qualified and non-const if they're not. And obviously you need to implement swap, copy, and move operations. And the only thing that this requires is that you don't have inheritance. So you should probably insert static assert is final inside of the implementation of heap value. If you do want to have inheritance and struct hierarchies, etc., then you should uh, again go back in time and watch Klaus's talk on type erasure. Again, really, really detailed explanation of type erasure, which made me delete, let's say, 10, 10 slides from my presentation, because when I saw that he covered everything in much more detail, I said, like, okay, kill, 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 <laughs> until, um, until I ended up with essentially zero type erasure. So that's the reason why, for example, the shared pointer to const felt a little bit out of place, because it was a little bit later in the slides. And if you don't want to watch any of the talks, you just want already pre-made solutions. Louis Dion uh, has a really cool library called Dino. Uh, it has a little bit awkward syntax, but it's quite, quite useful. And it allows you to have type erased objects that have full value semantics like Klaus talked about. Any questions for the sections so far? Again, online. Yes, I think we have a question on expected again. Um, so expected has and then or else and transform and transform error and monadic operations. Aren't those better than using coroutines? OK, good question. I do like those member functions. And I would say they are better than coroutines with uglier syntax, because you need to pass lambdas, and lambdas in C++ are really, really verbose. So if you chain and then transform, or else, etc., you will get with a huge chunk of random characters, angly brackets, and all of those brackets. Uh, with coroutines, you get a syntax that looks more like normal C++ code, just with additional keyword inside. But again, I would refer most of the questions for STD expected to the previous year's talk by somebody here. Uh, so if there are no more questions. Well, actually, I would. There's a cute question I have, which is related to copy and write. Mm -hmm. um, I've been reading line-wise into an std string, which is utf8, and then I have to convert that to, U, to, to cute string from utf8. And I figured out that like cute is not set up to reuse the buffer in a queue string. So calling from utf8 always um, allocates and gets you a new string object. Um, would it be possible like, to reuse an allocation inside a copy and write object when you only have like, one reference in it? I would say so, yeah. Usually, if you have a ref count and the reference count is one, and somebody, let's say, you move to somebody else, it's like a unique pointer. Nobody will access it anymore. You can do whatever you want inside. OK. OK. And the last one. The most important topic in, in the C++ today is the safety. And obviously, we are not going to solve the safety issues of C++ today. But at least I'm, I'll try to do some things that might improve the safety of, uh, let's say, future programs in the world. Now, most of this talk was about idioms. So whether those idioms are from 
functional programming or not functional programming, so the prog C++. The idiom is important for, for a few reasons. And the first thing is that when you see code like this, you know kind of what it does. You know what a four person person is, and if you use the person inside of the loop, that's the idiomatic way of using the range-based for loop. If you use persons directly inside of the for loop that goes through, through all the persons, then you're most likely doing something strange. If it's a const access, then let's say we're just going to close our eyes and ignore it. But if you're changing the persons while traversing over the collection, that's a huge no-no. And obviously not idiomatic code. The same thing goes for non-range based for a loop, so index one. Again, if we just have index something and until its size, we increment the index, and the idiomatic way to use, to use it inside is persons of index. Perfectly fine. Same if you access the index in a const way, it is also idiomatic. Otherwise, if you didn't need the value of the index, you would use the range-based for loop. So this is also idiomatic. Again, if you try to use persons outside of persons of index, it's not the idiomatic way to use the range based, uh, this index-based for loop. The same thing goes for the std transform. We have result resize because we want to convert all the strings inside of the words collection into integers. So we first resize the current vector to be able to fit everything inside all the results and just call transform from one collection to the other collection and use the parse integer function for it. And all of these are idiom idiomatic pieces of code that are not really wrapped inside of some higher order function, some algorithm, etc. We have the algorithm STD transform here, but the resize part is not a part of the transform. What are the idioms for? The first thing is that when, somebody, when you are trying to solve something and you have a lot of idioms in your head, most of the time it will make, you, make it easier for you to solve the problem. It's kind of like the, the pattern-oriented software architectures or whatever. If you know a lot of patterns and you have a problem, you can often fit the problem you have inside of a pattern. The same goes with idioms. If you know a lot of idioms, you will, be, uh, you will e more easily solve something that you want to implement. The second thing, if you wrote your code in idiomatic C++ or whatever language you're using, whoever reads your code will immediately, because it's an idiom and they know all the idioms that you do, they will see that idiom and they will know what that idiom does. They will not be confused by the resize here. But the one thing that is usually an afterthought in all of this is safety. Now, as far as the safety is concerned, I'm not going to go into defining safety. If you want uh, different definitions of safety, just check uh, JF's uh, Safety and Security, the Future of C++ from CPP Now talk. He spends a lot of time, and it's a, it's a really a brilliant presentation because he recognizes that safety is not only memory safety, but it's a more advanced concept. The reason why I don't want to define safety is that we are all going to differ in uh, thinking what safety is. So, for example, in some languages that I'm not going to mention, bounds checking is what provides safety. For me, bounds checking that throws exceptions is not safety. There was a research uh, for, not from C++, because we never catch exceptions, but in Java, uh, where you are forced to ca catch exceptions, so you need, if you call a function that is declared, I'm throwing this exception, you need to catch it somewhere. The research was, they investigated a lot of, a lot of open source code. For the libraries, they discovered that 40% of all catches are either empty or just logging. For normal applications, it went up to 90%. 
So throwing exceptions and then ignoring them, it's not safety. Obviously, the language is safe, it's not your undefined behavior, etc. Your code is in undefined behavior, you ignored an error. So this dot at on a vector, or whatever Rust calls it, or some other, let's say, emerging languages uh, for, to replace C++, they're not solutions for, for the issues. They're hiding one issue with just providing, okay, the user is to blame. It's no longer the fault of the language, now the user is at fault. Which is cool, obviously. It's better that the users are to blame than, than the language developers. But it doesn't really change any fact. It doesn't make the code any safer. Now, in the idiom that we've had before, bounce checking in this idiom is not needed. The unsafe operation here is index-based access of a vector. This is mathematically provable that this index is never out of bounds. Why do I need, if I iterate uh, through this a million times, do I really need it to go if, if this is greater than zero, if this is less than size? No, it's provable that this index is a valid inbounds index for this array. Now, obviously, you can get into issues. You can get a segmentation fault in this place, but not because of this code. Something might access persons and change the persons, and then you're out of bounds. But it's not the, uh, the fault of this code. It's the fault of you, first, for sharing uh, persons between two threads without any mutexes, without any locking. And it's essentially the fault of that other code, which is changing the persons. The same thing goes here. Usually when we have a destination iterator, we are never allowed to say dot .begin. We need back inserter, because it needs to be sure that, we, that it adds item by item. And if you just say dot .begin, it means, OK, I'm sure that I have enough space. I have enough elements inside of this collection to store all the results. So again, this is an unsafe operation. In this code snippet, in this idiom, it's perfectly mathematically provable that it cannot go bad. If we use transform, it means that the resulting collection have, will have the same amount of elements as the source one, and we have resized the resulting collection to the same size as the source one in the line above. Again, mathematically provable idiom that this is perfectly safe code, just like this one, without any performance penalties that, that we use this. Not even that we don't have any performance penalties, but this will be much faster than if we used back inserter, at least for vector of ints or other simple types. In the implementation of the lazy type that we've had, the only unsafe operation that we could have is the dereference of the optional. If the optional is empty, this would be undefined behavior. Can the optional be empty at this stage? Again, no. The call, one, call ones guarantees us that M data will be assigned the result of STD invoke. So again, provable that this is completely safe code without any runtime checks. The same goes with, with the heap value. We are dealing with pointers, with dynamic allocation, etc. But we have pro provided an API that is completely value-based. It's just that the value is stored somewhere else. Obviously, it would be a little bit more difficult to, to prove all of the attributes for this one than for the previous solutions. But again, it, this is easily provable, that this will behave as any other value inside of your code. Now, let's see one, uh, one more idiom that will emerge. Who has any issues with this code? Okay, so we all know that obviously we should not have dot .lock and dot .unlock. We should replace it with something like lock guard of or unique lock. Fair enough? 
who thinks that this code is not safe? Why so? Okay. Okay, the second answer I liked better. So the first one uh, is, let's say, more philosophical one. Mutexes are really hard to get right. And that, that one is true as well. So if we use this mutex here and forget to, to use it in another place, then uh, the fact that we have a log guard here doesn't really fix anything. But again, it's, it wouldn't be a problem of this function, but it would be a problem of a function that accesses the same locked data from uh, without before locking. But the second one, uh, deadlocks. Do you, do you see a deadlock that can just occur because of this code? Obviously, with three dots being anything in the world. Recursion. There was recently an article that, or maybe a paper for the standard, I don't really remember, that we shouldn't have standardized mutex, we should always use recursive mutexes. And that would be a completely fine fix for this deadlock, but Again, recursive mutexes might not be as fast, may blah, blah, blah. Can we find a better solution? So we can use a recursive mutex at all, uh, by default, or the second option, the Zen one, uh, the action through inaction, uh, don't do any locking at all. Does a function need to lock something because it wants to change it? If for example, if I work alone in a room, do I need to announce that I'm going I'm, uh, I, uh, no, uh, to the kitchen? I wanted to say something else, but I, I remember that I'm recorded. Uh, <laughs> we have a small kitchen, and I want to go into the kitchen. I say, okay, I'm going into the kitchen. And then nobody goes into... No, if I'm alone at home, obviously I don't need to, to lock the kitchen, right? So the function that inherently locks is a function that you expect, okay, this will be used only in multi-threaded environment. For a non-multi-threaded environment, it will just be, uh, let's say, uh, a waste, waste of CPU cycles. So a function that doesn't lock at all, but somebody from the outside coordinates what should be locked or not, would work in both situations. So for example, Again, if I'm alone in an apartment and I'm going to the, to the kitchen, I just go to the kitchen. Otherwise, if there are multiple people, we just put somebody on the door saying, okay, if somebody is already in, you need a key in order to open the kitchen. And until I get the key back from that person, I cannot give it to you. So what we can do is create, let's say, a private mutex, and the private class that will be called a unique key, or whatever you want to call it. Then you have a member function called take key. So the key cannot be forged by anybody else but this class, because it's a private type. So you cannot fake the key. If you want to get the key, if you want to call the function do something, you need a key. So if you want to enter the kitchen, you need the key, which means that you need to acquire that key from the referee beforehand. And then once you have the key, you can go through all the member functions that require that key. Do we have the recursion problem here? None of these functions re do any locking. The lock happens when you take the key. Then the function can recursively call itself, call itself and just pass the unique key on to the recursive calls. And when it exits, you just return the key back. Now, the cool thing about this is that unlike the previous CDMs where we had, like I, I said, mathematically provable, in this situation, this is compiler provable. In order to call a function, you have that key. 
compiler will say, just say you cannot, this cannot be compiled otherwise. So you have compile time proving of a small, let's say, theorem, which is kind of cool. If you can make your, let's say, idioms to look like this, obviously you should always. Just one uh, last direct digression to wake you all up. I recently went to Japan and uh, we went to a Buddhist temple in Tokyo uh, near that fish market thingy and the main hall was closed because of some burial ceremony or something like that. And we went into the second or third hall. So the prayer room, obviously, I'm, I'm not really a Buddhist, so I was a little bit out of place there, but it, it was really nice. Uh, and while we were walking out, uh, my better half saw a pamphlet. And obviously those pamphlets were meant for tourists to take and take home, right? But she is a strickler for rules, and we were also in Japan, which is a, a country that loves rules. So she took the pamphlet to a lady that worked at, at a desk and signaled, okay, can I take this? Obviously, the lady didn't speak any English. And she was like smiling. She was really, really nice. And then she just jumped up. We were a little bit surprised that at that point, instead of just nodding, somebody stands up and she started walking. And we were like, okay, we just asked, can we take this pamphlet home? And she did like this. And, okay, we need to follow her. And the situation was like in the, uh, the meaning of life, the last scenes from Monty Python. So that waiter that takes you through all the England's countries, etc. And she was going and going, and we were following and we were following. Then she started moving the barriers, do not cross, opens the door, we go through, do not cross, Op and we go, we have no idea what's going on. And at some point, obviously she's still smiling and we are smiling, obviously, although really confused. And at some point, she takes us to this small statue of a bull. And we were like, okay, <laughs> now what? <laughs> so, okay, it's a nice statue. And at some point, she pointed to the pamphlet. The pamphlet had a picture of the bull. <laughs> on, and obviously, she understood us that we want to see the bull. <laughs> and she was so... So, so kind in flip-flops and everything else to take us through the whole closed building because of the burial or whatever to see the bull. And we were so confused that we didn't even take a picture of the bull. This is from Tokyo Views. <laughs> the only thing that, that my better half managed to do is to pet the bull. <laughs> and that was it. So... Really, really, really strange story, but it, it was amazing. And the bull is, is really nice now that I see it on the picture. <laughs> now, the reason why I'm mentioning this is that, obviously, we were talking about idioms and stuff. If you're developing your own idioms, please make them correct. If you see something because somebody in your team didn't understand the language, so they had a language barrier with C++, and think that this is meant to be atomic int because it works. And they make it an idiom, and then it goes around the world as an idiom. No. All the idioms that you create should be either backed by standards, uh, standard or the mathematics or something else. You need to prove all of your idioms in order to use them safely and properly. So the benefits of developing everything with idioms, obviously safety, whatever safety means to you. For each of the idioms, you would prove the type of safety that you want. If you find a bug and you see this is an undefined behavior somewhere, you know it's not in the idiomatic code. So you're just going to remove all of those things and triage the bugs to, uh, to find a place where you didn't 
use the idiomatic code. And obviously, easier to prove correctness because if you had a dozen idioms uh, for C++ or hundreds and hundreds, you would already have some mathematical proofs for each of them. And then proving the correctness of the code would be easier. Obviously not easy. Mathematics is never easy, but easier to some extent. The downsides, obviously, if you're allowed just the right idiomatic code, it's kind of like development under trying to, to carry the the pyramids of Giza on your back. A lot more bureaucracy. If you want to do something custom, you would need to first invent an idiom that covers that, prove that, etc. And the last, but not the least, if you have a huge code base, which is obviously not going to be 100% idiomatic, you would need to rewrite most of it in order to just use the idioms. Now, the good thing is that you would be able to rewrite parts by parts and not like porting to a different language uh, where you would need to rewrite the whole project or create FFIs, etc. So it's not that big of a downside compared to some of the alternatives. So for the guidelines, because every talk should have some kind of guidelines or a summary, um, if you follow the TDD, uh, as, again, uh, talked about by Phil, you should also add IDD, which is idiom-driven development. If you find a bug in your code, don't just fix the bug. Think of an idiom which will, fo which will stop you from making the same bug ever again. Again, not an easy task. Uh, if you can create a generic function or generic class out of an idiom, please do so. If you can create an idiom in a way that it's provable by the compiler like the locking thing is, obviously do so. For other idioms like, for example, resize plus transform, write static analysis tools that will check whether the code is covered by an idiom or not. Okay. And that's it for me. <laughs> Thank you. Any questions? The online world asks, in the unique key example, shouldn't take key return a reference rather than a copy, or is it just a case of a slide where, where basically your code is just, you know, not production ready? Yeah, so. probably. Although it can be, it's not that important. So it, in this case, it should be a value because inside of that is the proper lock guard. It depends on how you implement the same thing. But in this case, I would say this is not slide where this was actually correct. Okay, so you're, you're returning a copy on purpose. So it's not a copy, it's essentially, we don't have uh, an instance of this thing anywhere inside of the class. This will create the lock guard on top of the mutex like we normally do. And it will just wrap it inside of a secret type which will be inside of the key. So it will be a move or let's say return value optimized uh, result and not a copy. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, you're on the right slide. Are you aware of the Copperspace libguarded library? Have you played with it? Uh, I've heard about it. They are actually, when I remember it correctly, implementing different versions of that for different use cases. So, the, but the, the to be honest, thing I, is the same. I really haven't checked the library. I know that they're doing some, let's say, interesting things uh, with regards to proper C++, but. I've never had an opportunity to work with the library and I wasn't curious enough to invest my personal time into it. 
libgarder is basically a separate library that only concerns about this. So it's only mm -hmm. implementing the guard part. Okay, uh, send me an email with, please. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks a lot for the talk. My question is about the copy and swap idiom. Uh, is the recommendation to always do assignments through the idiom, or uh, was that the recommendation, basically? And if yes, uh, what about the performance penalties you might uh, incur in some, some cases? Okay, so... Uh I like the question. It's not a clear answer. If, if you prefer safety to performance, I would say always. If you have situations where you want to allow yourself to have invalid states, it's fine, but then make guards that those invalid states don't somehow trickle down and destroy your program. So I would say, by default, I would use copy and swap. If I detect some performance penalties in the, care, in the places where I care about, then I would maybe think about how to optimize stuff and not go the other way around. Okay, uh, w wouldn't you argue that if you have to write a, a custom uh, assignment operator in the first place, uh, it, re let's say, requires its own uh, well consideration and uh, see how it should be implemented rather than uh, going for a generic way. Uh, I, I wouldn't say so. In essence, all the customization should go inside of the copy constructor and move constructor, and the swap is then again generic. Thank In you. essence, from, uh, from his personal history, every time that I've seen somebody implement a custom assignment operator, it led to bugs. So again, maybe it's the get off my lawn thing, but I would rather have the code that I don't spend hours debugging because I'm expecting something correct in a, the most trivial function in a class. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk, very nice. Just wanted to have a comment on this slide, actually, about the takey approach. Like, mm -hmm. I personally don't like it at all. So I wanted to ask what was the reason for proposing something like this rather than just some refactoring and following simple guidelines like public functions shouldn't call other public functions. So if you have the recursive case, just put it in a private function, you take a look on the public one, and you're good to go, right? So I just wanted to get a bit the motivation okay. behind this. Uh, short answer, this is compiler checked and whether something ends up being recursive or not after years of development is a huge investment to analyze all the call paths in, in the code so that you can do that, let's say, topological sort. Mm -hmm. So I would say, again, for me, compile time, something is always better than something else. Okay, okay, fair. Hey, cool talk. Uh, a bunch of those uh, idioms do require, like, whoever's using them to write a bunch of code that is not provided by the standard library, right? So, I mean, this example is one of them. Uh, you had the uh, heap uh, value, and then there was something about, like, polymorphic uh, dynamic uh, typing and things like that. Do you feel like this is the kind of thing that we should add to the standard, or maybe more like there should be a support library so every code base doesn't have to rewrite it or make its own copy? It's not a lot of code, but it's still a thing you can get wrong. I agree. Uh, I would say, just like the overloaded lambdas, I would love to see something like that in the standard. Uh, I would say, on the other hand, a lot of people don't really have the time, patience, and anything similar to that to invest into pushing something into the standard. So I would probably like the middle approach, a common library that everybody likes and uses to be the solution. Unfortunately, you get that into the XKCD situation of everybody creating their own library, which will be the one. So. Whatever happens, I'm completely fine. As you said, this is quite short code, uh, set of code snippets, just like overload it is. So it's not that difficult for everybody just to copy-paste into util.hpp. 
or stuff.hpp. Been there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for the really great keynote. Um, that was really nice. Um, I, I do wonder, like, you know, if you would like to see yourself or other people popularize the term progressive C++. I don't know. Um, in essence, the reason for the term. So I was always uh, jealous uh, for Jonathan Bocada's fluent C++. And some of the people had really nice names for, let's say, their websites. And I spent years developing and market research and everything else. Uh, for what should I call my website? And at some point, I call it called it Hi C plus plus or something like that. <laughs> so ki kind of close to let's say hippie movement rather than progressive rock movement. So this occurred to me let's say a few months ago, and I said, okay, I'm going to use this. So as far as the term is concerned. I didn't take a trademark. If somebody wants to use it, feel free so, to do so. But I wouldn't say, please go, go around and popularize. OK. Um, the next question I would like to have is, like, where do you see, or like, is it like idiomatic to contemporary C++, the keynote we had last year? OK, contemporary C++ I like for a general uh, C++ thing. Uh, the idea specifically for progressive was that, again, I'm usually connected and people think of me as the functional programming guy. But uh, you want to break that mold or? Kind of. I, I don't want to. I never wanted to take the functional programming and push every single thing inside of C++. It was more. I'm working on something, and I see something that I could improve, and it happened that some of the idioms were from FP. And then people started commenting on, yeah, but don't, do you hate object-oriented? No. Why, why should I? If I'm, a, I don't know, functional programming aficionado, why should I hate anything else? I think that all of those paradigms have something to offer, even combined, and that's the reason why I ended up with pro progressive C++. Okay. Um, let me see if there's any more questions. Uh, you're on the right slide. Um, thanks for the great <laughs> keynote. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, Funny how only this slide gets talked about. Uh, anyway, um, you said this code can't be misused, if I understood you correctly, and I took that as a, took that as a challenge. challenge. <laughs> um, so no, the, the thing is, um, I've used uh, a very similar approach uh, in our software, and it turns out I didn't think correctly, or I wasn't aware of this uh, issue. So it turned out to have a bug. The real issue why this got re-examined was that there was a compiler error with C++20 or something. Um, anyway, the unique key uh, being private doesn't mean you can't instantiate it if you're outside. It just means you can't refer to it by name. And so with okay. Deckel type, you can get the type and then instantiate it. But anyway, you can, you can argue that this is like defined private public, so intentional abuse. Um, but there's another thing I think that could, could happen by accident. And I think this is if you have two objects of this class and you take the key from one and then invoke a method on the other. Um, and the solution I took um, was to use a unique lock, even though I don't need uh, some of the features, uh, because it allows you to get the mutex pointer and then write an assertion that you actually, that the lock is actually for the right mutex. Sure, that's a great point. So uh, for the first, uh, for, for the first one, obviously, yeah, in C++, there are, yeah. just in like any law, there are holes that yeah. we can go through to do things that were me weren't meant to. So yeah, decal type of result of the take key and construct that. Um, 
for the second one, obviously uh, true. Uh, if you want to have multiple in instances of this object, then you would need to have some kind of an ID as well, whether it's a pointer to the mutex or something else. I agree. Thanks. I think that brings us to the last question. Um, so, you're not on the right slide, but we don't need to switch. Um, do you recommend using copy and swap instead of the compiler-generated assignment? It's kind of connected to one of the previous ones. If you, if you primarily care about safety, I would say yes. If you don't care about exceptions, then no. Okay, thanks. Then. To add to that, if you prefer even more safety, always L value qualify your assignment operators. So you cannot assign to a temporary. Sure. Well, and with that, I, yeah, well, final words are yours. Thank you for the keynote. Thank you for inviting me.